Let's call our December meeting the Idaho State Schools Board of Education to order. What a quick year this has been uh, as the last part of this month uh, seems to be fleeting toward us or us toward the end of the year, whichever way you look at it. Uh, we have quite a few things on our agenda tonight, uh, some things exciting early in the meeting. We have our Ardell County retired school personnel here with us tonight to uh, recognize us with singing, and we always look forward and enjoy that. Uh, so as we uh, begin our meeting, let me ask <clears throat> each one of you to bow with me in silent meditation for the first few moments, uh, keeping in mind the business that we have before us tonight as we try to lead our school system and provide the best opportunities for our students to uh, excel and be prepared for what approaches them uh, as they mature in the 21st century. So if you will, let's uh, bow for a few moments of silent meditation. Thank you. Uh, let's stand as the color guard from Statesville High School presents the colors and we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. You may be seated. Ms. Absher, we'll ask you to bring your group forward if you'd like, if you're ready. We'll gladly listen to some Christmas music. You are, you are.
And Alice, before you guys step down, we would like for you to come to the center of the, of the uh, stage there. And board members, if you would join them. Uh, Dr. Cash, there is a certificate uh, for our retired school personnel. These guys compete each year with other districts from around the state. And so coming out in the community and doing events like this, they score points for this. And we want to document the fact that they were here tonight and to uh, uh, a little more formally thank them for their support of the school system. This will be for their scrapbook. Now we get down to the working part of the agenda. I will ask before we begin uh, moving further along, are there any adjustments uh, to the agenda tonight that from any board member? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add a um, board member comment after the public comment. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, is the uh, personnel matter we had on our desk waiting for us included in the consent agenda? I'm not aware that it is. I think that'll be a separate voting item. Thank you. If there are no other adjustments then, let's begin with our consent agenda. Uh, under the administration portion, we <clears throat> have no items tonight. So we'll move on into the personnel portion. I uh, asked Dr. Lassane to, to come forward. We have items B, C, D, and E. For those in the audience, uh, <clears throat> the acceptance of resignations, retirements, rehires, terminations, and leaves of absence, the acceptance of classified personnel, approval of licensed personnel and approval of administrative appointments. Dr. Lassane. Dr. Cash, Mr. Johnson, members of the board, um, you have had the opportunity to review um, the December personnel report minus the addendum for agenda item 1E. And I would also like to point out that in your review under resignations, item number two and item number eight, just want to remind you that I'm sharing with you that those are delayed coming on the board report due to we needed to actually receive copies of the resignations from those school sites. And so that's why you see a little later, um, an earlier date in this year on those due to the paperwork not coming in from the school site for those resignations. Are there any other questions regarding the December personnel report? Is the same reasoning for the rehire number one? And it's stating effective date 10 1. Is that, are you going to say the school site was um, tardy? And I will have to um, check on that one. I think that off the top of my head, I want to check to make sure that that was a change in the in effective date that we had to shift in that one, but I can check that one and get back with you. Thank you. 
Any other questions? No other questions for Dr. Hussain regarding the consent agenda portion of the personnel. And I would also just like to remind the board, um, Dr. Cash, that also keep in mind the timelines for when we turn in paperwork and when it's coming through that cutoff. And so keep in mind that you will see things like if you see things back to September, then that's a, a red flag of something, but something necessarily from October would not totally be a red flag with the um, turn in timeline for our board materials. So, but I will find out about that particular one and get back with you. Says who? I mean, why, why would it not be a red flag? That's two months. But your processing timeline by the thing we, by the timelines that we pull things down for the board report, sometimes those things, I, I will create a timeline for you so you can see what I'm talking about because it's not immediate you've got a gap in time for when things come on the board report from when they're actually processed. I just think we need to be efficient and effective. And if someone's resigning, I would think there's a, they have two weeks, four weeks. That's where I'm coming from prior to the resignation uh, date. But thank you. You're welcome. And with that resignation, I just want you to know that when I talk about a gap in notification, just for your information, we can't, pro we don't know sometimes if we don't receive that resignation letter from the school, then we don't know until we process payroll. So if that resignation happened at the beginning of a payroll period, we make it to the end, we reconcile documents that have come from the school from payroll, then we place a phone call and say, where's this resignation letter? That ends up, that's how sometimes you get things backed up. And those two cases are examples of that. Okay, you have a comment? Let's go make a motion. Okay, well, we have uh, the minutes as well from uh, November 3rd, Committee of the Whole meeting and November 10th, Board of Education meeting. I ask if if there are uh, no additions or okay. uh, corrections to those minutes, entertain a motion now to approve the consent agenda items in the minutes from November. So moved to, to approve those minutes. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, let's move on into the uh, recognition uh, portion of our meeting then, the uh, Community Schools Award, uh, Ms. Wahlberg. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Well, tonight, it's MB Mills night tonight, just so everybody knows. Classroom Central is a nonprofit organization from Charlotte, and they've been a strong partner of Iredell Statesville Schools for many, many years. Uh, we are able to participate with mobile deliveries of supplies to our teachers, and most recently, a couple of our schools have been the recipients of school supplies to every single student in the building. So tonight, we're here to celebrate the great things that happened at MB Mills. Early one September morning, this is gonna sound kind of like a story, like twas the night before Christmas. Early one September morning, two men in a truck arrived at NB and they were loaded to the gills, the truck was loaded. Pulling into the parking lot along with the box truck were employees of Newell Rubbermaid. Of course, right behind them came the staff from Classroom Central. It was a real party and everyone placed heavy boxes in front of classroom doors, every classroom door at MB Mills. The students arrived, the day began as normal, but soon the halls were bustling with all these volunteers sweeping into classrooms, giving every child a bag filled with supplies for them to take home. And it was, it was really, really thrilling. Newell Rubbermaid did this as a, as, a community, uh, as a community event for their corporation. So the time, the expense, the effort to make all this happen was a very gracious expression of commitment to our students from these community partners. We would like to thank two men in a truck, 
Newell Rubbermaid, and our longtime friends at Classroom Central for their generosity. And tonight, Megan Woods from Classroom Central is hiding back there in the back. Megan, you're going to have to come up here. Um, Kim Mitchell is here, the principal at MB Mills. Megan is going to take the uh, certificates back to Newell Rubbermaid and to Two Men in a Truck. Right, Megan? Right? That's what you're going to do. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. I think from the, in the last four or five years, we're over $200,000 worth of supplies from Classroom Central, aren't we? Well over 200000 So it's been an amazing partnership, and we thank you. So Kim, would you come up too, please? And Ms. Haynes, would you please do the, the three certificates that are stacked? So, MB Mills again. The students at MB Mills really benefit from several partnerships in their local community, and tonight we're going to recognize some more, and these are faith-based. And I'm not sure if anybody is here from Front Street, or the Front Street's here, the Cove, and I know Jill's here, so yay, thank you. Nobody from the Cove, okay. Front Street Baptist Church donates an enormous amount of school supplies to our students every year, and this year was no exception. Without the help of Front Street, many of the students would begin school without the necessities to start off their year on a steady footing. So once again, there are those school supplies. Monticello United Methodist Church runs Ubuntu Camp every summer, and this academy brings together skilled reading <coughs> teachers and third to fifth grade students who struggle with reading uh, and a church family for a six-week camp experience. The goal is to help the students enjoy their summer while also growing in their literacy skills, and we wouldn't be able to do that without Monticello. The Cove Church in Statesville brought lunches all summer long for students in the MB Mills community, served at a local park, and in October, the Cove did a picnic finale for the entire community. So there was great food and great people. We all know it truly does take a village, and the village of MB Mills is richer because of the presence of these wonderful faith-based partners. So thank you all. And if you would, Ms. Haynes, please come back. And um, Jill, we want to do a big group. All individual
Next, we'll move on to item B, the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. Uh, this is not MB Mills, but this was so incredible, and we've known about it for a while, but we couldn't say anything until last Tuesday at 2 o'clock, but I have to confess, I, I broke the secret, and I announced it at Rotary at 1 o'clock, but I made them all pinky swear they wouldn't say anything till 2. The Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation keeps music alive in our schools by donating musical instruments to underfunded music programs, giving youngsters the many benefits of music education, helping them to be better students, and inspiring creativity and expression through playing music. We know what that does. The foundation also has a dream that all school districts will make a long-term commitment to keeping music alive in their schools. They believe, and I believe our district knows, that kids thrive when given the chance to learn and play music. Putting an instrument into, the hands, into their hands improves the quality of their education and their lives. The window is brief, and all kids deserve a chance to play music in school. Through the effort of Mr. Rico Solomon, who is not here tonight, I thought he might be, the band director at Statesville Middle School, his students now have a chance to enrich their music education through a grant received from the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. Mr. Solomon will be receiving 25 new instruments. This, the donation is French horns, saxophones, flutes, trumpets, and other instruments, and they will enable his program to grow. High school bands, as people know, rely on the success of middle school band programming, and Iredell Statesville schools are committed to keeping their rich tradition of excellent high school and middle school bands. So we give many thanks to Mr. Solomon because he took the time to write the grant, and a resounding thank you to Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation because he now will have, in the next couple of weeks, 25 new instruments for his students. So. Mr. Solomon, when did you sneak in? <laughs> Has he been here this whole time? Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys really need to screen your employees better. Okay. <laughs> I didn't even see you. Come on up. I'm sorry. Didn't even see you there. Susie, while, while we've got him here, let's do a picture for our website. So, board members, somebody would like to join us? Let's document this. All of us? You can't tune the radio. Next item uh, under recognitions is the CCTL of the Apple Distinguished School. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Cash, members of the board. I'm going to do my little presentation a little bit different. I'm going to call my folks up so y'all can get a good look at them while I'm reading my memo. So I see uh, Ms. Hutchins here with some of her staff members. All of you guys come on up. And if you got a student with you, bring them up with you too. Yeah. We are pleased to announce that the uh, Collaborative College for Technology and Leadership has been selected and recognized as an Apple Distinguished School for 2014-16 for its technology-infused learning environment in which students create and demonstrate knowledge at high levels. The Apple Distinguished School distinction is reserved for programs that meet criteria for innovation, leadership, educational excellence, and demonstrates Apple's vision of exemplary learning environments. Principal Terry Hudgens recognizes her outstanding students and staff for their successes as it relates to Apple technology to enhance their reading, thinking, writing, talking in every classroom every day. The selection of CCTL as an Apple Distinguished School highlights their success 
as an innovative and compelling learning environment that engages students and provides tangible evidence of academic accomplishments. Their students enjoy learning and demonstrating their learning in unique ways via the technology such as Apple iWorks, productivity tools, and iMovie. Teachers enhance students' learning experiences within the one-to-one -one technology environment through the use of a variety of applications to transform instructional units, assessments, feedback, and the learning environment. CCTL has, uh, has seen completing compelling results due to the implementation of the MacBook rollout, including academic performance on state tests that is in the top 6% of all North Carolina high schools, a graduation rate that is 100% and 100% of teachers annually achieving student growth <coughs> targets. <clears throat> These results are achieved with a target population of students who are first generation to attend college underrepresented in universities or at risk of not completing high school and college. Congratulations to all of the men and women of CCTL for the great recognition and honor you've brought on our district. Congratulations to you. Um, ask that all board members go down and pose with them. This is a big deal. We want all of our board members down front on this one. Right here, Chuck. Chuck. Susie, hang on just a minute. Next recognition we have tonight is uh, Officer David Johnson, the SRO at uh, Statesville High School. Mr. Johnson. Officer Johnson, will you come forward, please? Yeah. <coughs> Board members, Officer David Johnson is retiring from the Statesville Police Department at the uh, end of December 2014. Officer Johnson is the first and longest serving SRO in the Iredell Statesville Schools. He is also the former SRO of the year. Uh, to honor this uh, occasion, I'd like to take just a moment and point out some of the highlights of his career. <clears throat> Officer Johnson was sworn with the Statesville Police Department in 1988. In February of 1994, he was chosen school resource officer for Statesville High School. During the 2001-2003 year, he served as the Region 7 representative for the North Carolina Association of School Resource Officers. In 2004, the Statesville Police Department uh, recognized him as the Community Officer of the Year. In 2005, he was recognized by the State of North Carolina as the North Carolina School Resource Officer of the Year. In 2008, he was recognized as the National Police Athletic League Officer of the Year. 2008 to current, he has served on the North Carolina Juvenile Justice Board and currently serves as the president of that association. In 2009, he was the North Carolina Juvenile Officer of the Year. In addition to all of those accolades from his police work, he also truly exemplifies what a school resource officer should mean. He serves as an advisor to the Student Council and the SAD Club. He also organizes the Snow King and Queen Court each year and has organized countless field trips for students, including trips to Disney and New York, works with the AP Academy. It's just endless what this man has done there at Statesville High School. We're certainly gonna miss him. Joining him tonight is his wife and his son and Assistant Chief Barone from the Statesville Police Department. 
And again, this is such a big deal. If y'all don't mind, could all of you go down front? And he's got, a, he's got a plaque there that we'd like to present him. And I would invite his family and Chief Barone to join the, uh, the photograph. Can I just say thank you to OJ too? He was the um, he was there when all three of my girls went to Statesville High School, and it's just always nice to have an extra set of eyes on on your kids. So thank you every for everything that you did and you, you continue to do. Thank you, OJ. And, and I, I want to second that. I, I worked with OJ. I was at Statesville <laughs> High School when he came back in '94, and uh, he is Statesville High School. I I, I don't know. I really don't know how the school's going to get along without him. But, O.J., we've been through a lot together, and, uh, you know, you're just part of the, You'll always bleed blue and gray, I'm sure. So enjoy your retirement. Maybe we'll go fishing one day, but thank you for what you did. Thank you for your service. Again, let's give him a round of applause. Also does a good job being a cruise director too. They have a, several cruises over there, and his son, <laughs> his son goes on them. So, well, the next item on our agenda is the Bright Ideas Grant Awards. Uh, Mr. Johnson, would you like to introduce that? Thank you, Dr. Cash, members of the board. Tonight we have uh, Mike Russell from Energy United with us. And Mike, if you can go ahead and make your way to the microphone. Uh, two of our teachers tonight are being recognized as recipients of the Bright Idea Grants. Uh, Christy Manners from NB Mills and Leslie Lackey from North Iredell Middle School. And I think both those teachers are here. So ladies, if you could make your way to the front, please. And if you don't mind, teachers, tell us just a, a real short little summary of the project that you're working on at your school, thanks to the grant. And then Mike will let you tell us about the work that your company continues to do in the community through Bright Ideas. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Christy Manners. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, what a fantastic evening, um, showcasing all of the community support for the schools. Um, my wife's a teacher in Charlotte Mech Schools. Um, don't hold that against me. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just amazing the amount of support that um, the, the community has for our schools. And Energy United, we're the largest electric cooperative in North Carolina. We're headquartered here in Statesville. Um, and the Bright Ideas grant program was started 20 years ago by all 25 electric cooperatives in the state. It's a program designed to fund innovative classroom projects that otherwise would not receive funding. Um, over those 20 years, over $7 million has been granted to um, North Carolina educators. This year, we received over 100 applications for grant funding just in the Energy United territory. Um, 29 grants were awarded. Um, for just under $40,000 this year. So it's, uh, it's a great program and congratulations. And as the uh, superintendent said, would you just talk a little bit about what your bright idea is? Uh, we've actually got the name of our projects reversed, but um, my, I teach socially emotionally disabled students. And so the importance of my students understanding that it's okay to be angry, but how we handle the anger is the issue and so we're going to make an anger station where they can go and sit in a beanbag chair and listen to music or talk to one of um, 
my assistants or myself to talk about what's, what's caused the anger and how we can handle it appropriately because sometimes our choices aren't the, the best. And so I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm so thankful. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Leslie Lackey, and I am doing a classroom gardening center. I love to garden. I love, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an indoor greenhouse, a, a tall stacked one, and I'm going to uh, grow seedlings um, and plant pumpkins and gourds and flowers. And I am a representative of the Beta Club for the seventh grade at North Middle. So. Uh, different times of the year we do beautification projects where we plant flowers around the schoolyard so I'm going to grow the seedlings to do that uh, like pansies or, or whatever type of flower we come up with and um, I wanted to do projects where we took gourds and dried them out and made birdhouses and hung them around the trees at the school and I just grow pumpkins and I think it's really nice for the students to know how to do that and then to take the seeds that they produce and and grow use them and keep growing those seeds over and over again okay. thank you uh, mr. James and uh, miss Haynes would you like to join them for the picture Congratulations again to all those who received uh, recognitions, honors, awards, scholarships tonight to uh, uh, proceed with uh, moving forward with uh, bright ideas especially. Uh, that concludes our, our recognition portion of the meeting tonight, so we'll move on into the non-consent agenda. Uh, the first item we'll bring to the non-consent agenda will be the uh, additional personnel item that was brought to us tonight. Uh, as a board, uh, we've recognized that uh, we need to uh, replace the uh, resigning principal at Statesville High School, and we know that this has been a process that the administration has been eager to get accomplished so we could get uh, the principalship at that school uh, established and settled, especially before the Christmas uh, holiday season. And the interviews, I understand, took place last week. This will be the first opportunity for the board to hear uh, the results of the interview process and to hear the recommendation from the administration uh, to us regarding their, their recommendation for the uh, person to be appointed as principal at Statesville High School. So it felt like this would be most appropriately brought off the consent agenda and brought to us as a discussion and voting item since uh, we have not had a chance to discuss this earlier. Mr. Johnson, I'll uh, turn it over to you or Dr. Lassane, however you want to handle that uh, regarding uh, the recommendation for Elizabeth Bradley to be principal at Statesville High. Right. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Cash, members of the board, um, we did uh, convene a committee of teachers and Dr. Lassane can certainly share the teachers and the staff members and community members that served on that committee. Um, as you know, in our school system, we believe in uh, sharing decision making, uh, particularly when it comes to big decisions like this. We use a Trigo Ed process, a decision analysis uh, process. Um, at the end of that uh, work, 
uh, last week, uh, we were given uh, four names to interview, and we, uh, the executive staff and myself, uh, conducted those interviews Friday. Um, the name that we would like to submit to you tonight is uh, uh, Elizabeth Bradley, Beth Bradley. She is currently the principal up at uh, Monticello Alternative School. Uh, Dr. Bradley has been with our school system for more than a decade. Uh, she has served as an SAP coordinator, a guidance counselor, an assistant principal, and a principal. Uh, we'll be happy to entertain any questions that you have for us concerning the recommendation. Mr. Johnson, uh, my concerns are, and I'm trying to figure out what we're going to discuss in open session or if we need to go in closed session. Uh, I do have some questions about the process, not particularly the person. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people in the last uh, 24 hours, actually, and prior to that, I'm just wondering, uh, when did we post this job? Could you answer that, Dr. Lassane? Dr. Lassane probably can. I would have to go back to my records to see the actual um, posting date, but um, this was posted um, prior to the Thanksgiving holiday. Okay, so uh, mid to late November. When uh, when was the uh, application process closed? The applications cro closed prior to Thanksgiving. They closed prior to Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. and, and when were the initial interviews? The initial interviews were last week. I know, which day? I, um, it was Tuesday. Um, they were Tuesday okay. were the interviews. Well, I've just been asked by a lot of people and we interviewed on Tuesday. Uh, in less than a week, the entire process is done. Seems to be a, a mighty big rush for such a, I think, important decision. Uh, is less than a week a normal turnaround? When you're talking about interviews, yes. But as far as the whole process, the whole process has been much longer than a week because we had to do research on all of those applicants that submitted, we had to near, narrow an initial larger pool to a pool that was reasonable to interview. How was that done, ma'am? That was done by looking at the qualifications of the candidates now, based on who, because we have applicants that apply for, for example, for principalships that don't even have an MSA degree. So they would not even be licensed, so we had criteria that we reviewed from their degrees, their teaching experience, their um, principalship experience, um, a search, basically just a basic search, not a criminal background search, but a basic search um, to see what the reputation of the individual would be. All of those um, were factors to narrow the pool. And I'm gonna ask our attorney to uh Stop me if uh, I ask something that's a closed session issue. Can you tell me how many, there was 26 total applicants, is that correct? Yes. How many of those have ever been high school principals? From Are they the traditional high school, like Statesville High School? For a traditional high school? For traditional high school. I would have to go back, Mr. Page, to all of the applicants, but off the top of my head, for a traditional high school, um, we probably had three candidates. And how many of those were in the final 10? Um, in the final 10, there were two that were interviewed in that final 10. That had been high school principals. Mm -hmm. And I would have to go back and look at every single person, but I know two off the top of my head. Did you feel completely comfortable with this process? I do. Do you feel comfortable with the Trago process? I do. Do you think it's subjective or objective? 
I think that anytime you're looking at hiring, you're going to have some subjectivity because you're dealing with human beings. But I think it's a lot um, different and a lot more objective than processes that were used prior to our district initiating Trago. The, but the scores are negotiated, is that correct? They're not, in other words, each participant does not get to write their score down and it's not average. The scores are negotiated by the group, is that correct? I would not say that the scores are negotiated by the group. I think that what's different from some traditional interviewing processes is traditional interviewing processes look at a candidate and they say with this category, this person's this, 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 you know, and you may give them a number based on a rubric. The thing that's different about Trago is you actually have to discuss with that team candidate A in comparison to candidate B. And so who is the top in this particular category? And so you're actually looking at them and justifying, okay, if this person, if I say this person is the top candidate, then this is why I say they're the top candidate. And a lot of times, I think in traditional um, interview processes, you're not gonna see the richness of the dialogue that comes from that process. If it is discussed and everybody brings their two cents to the table, would you say that the strongest personality in the group probably leads that process? Not necessarily. I think that you have to be able to facilitate. Um, so everyone's sitting there arguing their points. You don't feel like the strongest personality, uh, the, the most aggressive person in that group doesn't have an advantage on getting the scores they would like to have? Well, I would say any time that you're working with a team that you have some voices that are louder than the others, but there were many times during the process to make sure that that does not happen, we actually stop and go around the table where everybody has the chance to say their voice. Um, we do not allow people to sit at a table and argue. Um, in their discussion, we stop the process and have everyone go around and say who, there were numerous times, um, and I don't want to go too far, especially with team members I understand with that, that, but you give everybody an opportunity to express their voice. These are all individuals who were chosen by their colleagues to serve on a team, and they were chosen to serve on that team based on their ability to be able to represent themselves as well as the, voice, the voices of their colleagues. And I think that we had an outstanding team um, representing Statesville High School. I agree. I think it was a good team. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt about that. Do you think the team members are happy and satisfied with the process? I think that the team members are just like every other team when you have the weight of a decision and you have a superintendent that entrusts its employees and its stakeholders to have a voice in a process, that comes with a great deal of weight. And I would have serious reservations if somebody didn't walk away saying, whoa, this is a heavy decision. But remember that that team is not deciding who's hired. That team selects the top three people to sit before Mr. Johnson and whoever he selects. They didn't even know who that individual was until Dr. Cash um, just stated it. The team has, and the entire team has no idea because that had not been communicated to them. Well, uh, there are some team members that do have did have some concerns about the process. Uh, I, I'm a little concerned that we've rushed it. Why did we make, or why was the decision made to uh, not look at an interim, but go to a, uh, uh, do you not think by doing it in, in now, in the middle of the year, that we have lost some? Mr. Page, I'm gonna stop you right here. Yeah. We can talk about 
right now we can talk about the overall process right. and the details about the overall process, but the closer we get to the actual individualized process that led to this decision with this employee, that should be done in closed session. Uh, okay. So. Let, the question I've asked is, did we limit our potential employees by doing it in the middle of the school year? I really actually think you will find among most administrators, they would prefer to come into a new school in the middle of the school year. You will often hear administrators talk about that what happens around that July time, time frame, you are already starting, you know, behind at that point in time. You will find that many of the conversations among administrators would actually prefer to come in in the middle of the year so that they have a good opportunity to be able to listen and get to know people and make good decisions to start out a good clean year. They're taking inventory when they first come in, but that is also subjected to who the particular administrator is. There are some that would like that. I'm sure you could find some that would rather start out in July. I would say too that what the staff told us is they were anxious to get a leader in their building. And by appointing an interim principal and waiting another six months, I don't think that that was what the staff was looking for and I don't think that was healthy for the school. Uh, they made it clear to me that we want a principal, we want him on board right away. Uh, they're crying out for leadership at Statesville. Uh, will we pre be presented a contract to vote on? Yes, that was part of closed session. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I got, well, this one, I, this is Dr. Bradley now. She's just finished her doctor, correct? She is Dr. Bradley. That's correct. Correct. And do, can you, are you allowed to tell us how with the Trago, how did she figure in the Trago? Like one, two, three, I cannot do that in open session. You can't do it? Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, is this typically done? talking about the the chosen person before the no, board No, ma'am, normally you folks go into closed session. Well, that's what I wondered also. That's why. I Very concerning to me. Um, I just 50, now maybe 65 minutes ago just saw this. Is this how we run things as a board? No, normally we go into closed session first and have this discussion and then come out and make our recommendation. So why did... What are we doing? Yeah, why are we doing it that way then? I thought that was your desire. I, I'm surprised. I, I asked if we were going in closed session. I mean, I, I asked where we're going to talk about it now in closed session. So I would recommend you go in closed session well, now. Well, I thought we should have too. So. All right. Would it please the board to go ahead and finish the rest of the items on the agenda for those present in the audience uh, that are here for those reasons and then go into closed session? or do we want to break the meeting into parts and go into closed session? I'll leave that to the pleasure of the rest of the board. I think we're discussing something. I think we need to do it now, but that's up to y'all. No, I disagree. I think we should finish the rest of the business of the board and go into the normal closed session at the end of okay. the session to discuss that particular item and uh, come back at the end of that. So we're deferring it to the end of the policy. Okay. okay. I agree with Mr. Kelly. All right. Well, let's, uh, if that's the consensus of the board, let's move forward then with the other items on our agenda, and then we'll go into closed session uh, and discuss this with the other issues in closed session. Um, next, then, we'll have the uh, Union Grove and NB Mills primetime for kids discussion. This is a voting item. Uh, it's Melissa White, uh, standing in for Diana Eller. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Eller had a family emergency to attend to, so I'm going to um, try to communicate as best as I can recall from our discussions um, last Monday and my discussions with Ms. Eller regarding this decision. Um, the Union Grove Primetime Program has been losing money for the past few years now. Um, the Primetime Program as a whole has been losing money, so there's no... Um, additional site that's making enough profit to offset the loss that we're having at Union Grove. Um, Union Grove currently has 12 students that attend, eight of which attend on a full-time basis. That means four attend on a part-time basis. 
it takes about 19 students to break even. So we're quite a far ways away from that. So it is our recommendation that we close the Union Grove prime time location um, effective. Do we have an effective date on this? January 31st? Okay. Um, in addition to that, we also recommend that we close the morning program for MB Meals prime time. Um, there are only eight students enrolled at that site in the morning. Um, they only paid $10 for the entire month to attend in the morning, so there's only an additional $80 of revenue that's generated each month, and that is not sufficient to support the cost of operating the morning program at MB Mills. So we have those two recommendations, and we do have a few other sites that are um, on a monitoring basis. They need to increase their attendance in order to justify remaining open, um, and those sites will be looked at at the end of the school year and reevaluated for possible closure or consolidation the next school year. And I'll try to answer any questions that you that that you may have. Melissa, I just wanted to ask a quick question. You may or may not know the answer to this. Have the parents been notified that this was an impending decision? I do not know the answer. I believe that they have been. I don't know if anyone in attendance knows that answer. I can answer a little bit of that question. I was going to address, uh, I spoke to several parents because I live in that community, and uh, I understand their, their uh, position. There's a couple things that were concerned, and I, I talked to Mr. Johnson about this and the, the way we uh, need to look at uh, the future for this, and uh, because it's a very important program. The numbers are there that it's very beneficial to the kids that need it, the things that are there. But it is about the expenses and the cost of this. The parents, uh, according to the instructor there, uh, was notified and notified them last Thursday. So they feel like they've got a short window. But they also have time, if they can get enrollment between now and July, January 31st, that they could survive the program. They uh, have asked, they're doing a great program up there. They've got a really great instructor. And, uh, and I think the, uh, the kids' numbers are really uh, tough because it's a small school. Uh, compared to other schools and uh, so we've gone through some other scenarios that are there I hate it for the parents that are there I know it's going to be a tough decision but we've got to make sure that it's sustainable and uh, that it's there um, we've talked about some decisions that even next year may look at moving those uh, these prime time to the middle schools because we already have buses that go there it wouldn't incur us incur any money and then you'd have less instructors in a more concentrated area then you could pick up these these numbers that are on the edge and so I think we need to look at all the programs across the board in, in the future in that. But I do want to speak on behalf of those parents that did feel like they got shorted a little bit in that. That information was presented to us when we first came, when I first came on the board that it was a problem. So we knew about it back in, uh, I'm going to say September, I believe is when she made that presentation at the board meeting or the Cal meeting. So we did know that information was there and they needed to get their enrollment up. Um, but it's, uh, again, We've got to be sustainable. This is just one of uh, the next hundred tough budget questions we're getting ready to answer on this board. And uh, so I, I think it's, it's one of those things where we've got to be responsible for these taxpayers' dollars. And uh, if it's not being sustainable, unfortunately, that's, that's the direction it's going to go. And, and also with NB Meals. I can't speak for them, but uh, I just want to speak for those parents that they were disgruntled a little bit, but they do have time to, uh, to recover that if they can get other kids to sign up. Yeah, thanks, Mr. James, for pointing that out. It does give them two months. Um, or if you wanted to amend this and give them a third month, then that's your pleasure to do that if you'd like. And the question that Ms. Bonham asked, I mean, the principal of NB Mills is here. Do you know, have the parents been notified? Ms. Mitchell, I don't put you on the spot, but I know you're the principal of NB Mills, but do they know that this is going to happen? I feel I'm just going to speculate based on the fact that the parents at Union Grove have been notified. I'm just going to jump to the conclusion that the parents at NB Mills have been notified. But again, I have no basis for that, just really speculation. But I would imagine that she would have notified both at the same time. Could the I guess my question, you know, and also getting around to um, the fact, is this a, could this conceivably be a, po a profit generating um, endeavor? If, if um, you speak of that particular site? 
for the whole program? The, the whole program in general, I mean, you know, could we spend a little more time in recruitment, you know, of parents or marketing to parents? Um, you know, is this kind of, if it's a break even, break even type thing or, um, if well, it's I think the best we can, we can hope for right now is to break even. Um, <laughs> let's take it baby steps, they're losing a substantial amount of money. Um, so I think the first thing we want to do is close sites that really we don't see the population growing to support it and then start to work on sites to where we can actually gain some profit. But really the point is for it to at least be able to support itself. It doesn't necessarily have to bank a bunch of money. That's not the, the objective we're trying to achieve. We want to provide these, par these parents with a program that will enrich their kids' um, educational experience and not build a bunch of profit, just get what we need to run the program. And right now, um, that particular site at Union Grove and a few others are just not, they don't have the enrollment to support um, the expense of running the program. Um, this is an enterprise fund, which means that it's like a business and it should be looked at like a business. Um, so the revenue that it generates should be enough to support the program. And at some point in time, if we don't start making some of these decisions, the local current expense fund, if the board chooses to continue with the program, will have to support the program, not just the expenses or the revenue that's generated from the parents. And do you know if, if a marketing program was, was put forth at Union Grove or the whole program? I know that over the, these sites. Okay, I know that over the summer they have um, tried to put all their staff in T-shirts so they're identified. They've they've redone their logo and put nice new signs out, trying to encourage enrollment at all of their site locations. Um, and I think that they have tried to be more of a presence in the school to get the word out to the maybe parents that aren't currently participating. Um, but I don't have children, but I, I know that if you have children, there are so many different programs that you compete with at the same time within our same community. The Boys and Girls Club is a program, um, particularly in the MB Mills neighborhood. It's a free program for parents, so it's hard to compete with free. Um, the YMCA is a program that offers a lot of um, pickups at our, a lot of our sites. So it's a competitive market, and they're doing, I think, the best that they can to be competitive while also being reasonable in their rates. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I know this isn't your, this is not your area, Fine, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thought maybe you might know. One other thing I was going to say, Union Grove is a very rural community. They don't have the competition. That's the problem. We even, I even spoke with her when they first had this problem. I went to her and see if the, the Methodist Church across the way could do something, if we could find something that would help these kids that was close and safe and something that was within those boundaries. And, and they're struggling with that. But the, uh, I think if there is an option to extend it one more month, that would be fair to the parents to at least give them time to find things because I know January is going to be a tough month on budgets for a lot of people, especially in, in our rural community where the where the money is not as uh, as options are not as as, as fruitful, and uh, so um, I'd make a motion that we accept this recommendation if we could move it to <coughs> February 28th. You have a motion to accept the uh, closing of the. Union Grove and NB Mills primetime uh, programs as stated uh, with the extending uh, the change of, involving extending the time limit uh, or time frame until February 28th. That would give those parents time to get the <coughs> recruitment and they could make themselves sustainable okay. if they have the opportunity. Is there a second to that motion? I'd second that. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just have to comment <coughs> that we've talked about the prime times where two years now. And all the programs were notified in reference to the numbers and the numbers they needed to be able to be sustainable. And they were told along those lines and they have tried, like you said, they've put out posters, they've sent signs, they've sent letters. And whether there's competition or not, they did not move and there weren't enough to come in to make the program at least to come out even. Uh, I mean, you can extend it another month, but you're just kicking it down the road as they have said 5,000 times. But you can do that, that's okay, but they're, they're not going to be sustainable. They're, the numbers are not going to come in. We've tried and tried, I know we've tried in several schools, we've tried in all the schools to get these programs up to running and they simply have not reached that point, so. Well, I don't know that, and I can help you answer a little bit of that. 
they're looking at sponsorship from some of the local businesses that would pay the amount of money that it would take if you had 19 kids enrolled and they only have 12 or 14. So they, they were gonna try to make themselves sustainable. If that gives them one more month where they only have to come up with the money for three months to get through the end of the school year, that's what they're asking for. If you can get to the end of the school year, um, with our budgets, I'm not, I told them I wasn't willing to ask for that. I, unless you can make it sustainable. I really didn't know there was an option to extend them a time, but if we can extend them one month, I think if, if they can find that sponsorship, they may stay open to the end of the school year. There is an opportunity. I don't know that they're gonna get any more kids enrolled. I agree with you. So I'm just trying to, trying to help those families do the best they can do. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's no problem. Uh, I, I just doubt that's gonna happen, but we can wait and see if that's what you wanna do. That's up to the board. I have one comment or question. Ms. White, if we know that it takes 19 students to have a self-sustainable program with prime time, um, has the district ever said if you don't have 19, we can't do it at the beginning of the year before school starts? Not to my knowledge. And Mr. Johnson, have we considered that instead of kicking it down, you know, the can down the road? I mean, if, if we know it's not sustainable as mr kelly pointed out we've been talking about this for two years and um, when it's time to make the tough decision uh, folks have trouble making that decision as as you guys are tonight um, the primetime program has been able to sustain these underperforming programs for a number of years and they do that out of their fund balance <coughs> uh, but as time goes on uh, miss eller the new director has has uh, made the decision it's, it's, try, it's time to be realistic about this. And this is not something that she can continue to subsidize uh, for those programs that don't have enrollment. Uh, so she brought the recommendation to you guys with the, with the idea that giving uh, the parents two months notice was, was ample uh, to close this program down. Uh, I think the suggestion now is to move it to a three month notice, uh, but again, if, if you guys are not comfortable with that, you can, you can put any number in there that you'd like to. If you wanna sustain this throughout the rest of the school year, you're, you know, this board has the authority to do that. But I think what Ms. Eller's trying to do is uh, be a good steward of the, of the program and to be realistic. Um, in, in years past, she was able to sustain underperforming programs, but it's just not an option in the future. Um, but we're, we're at your recommendation on this. If, <coughs> if well, the number that I look at here at the bottom, profit loss before administrative costs, I assume that's for the year or for that point or up to that point is $13,000. <coughs> that would be another $13,000 that would have to come out of our fund balance. They and still have their own fund balance that they're able to um, draw from. <coughs> we're trying to to be proactive so that they don't run out of fund balance and have to be supplemented with the local current expense fund. Right, and we don't, I really don't want to get to that. I really don't. This is obviously an optional program. It's not required program under, you know, general statute. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we've been doing all along. We've been doing a program to help and it's not sustainable financially. So we're to the point now in which being the nice guy is something that we love to be able to do, but it's not something we can afford to do. So if we, we add another month, we're just gonna add another month of cost. And like he says, if they can find money to cover that, more power to them. But this has been talked about for a number of months and that did not happen. So that just depends on whether or not you wanna give them the opportunity to do it. So no other comments, we have a motion second on the floor to approve this recommendation uh, with the uh, change that we move the discontinuation date to February 28th. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No, I don't no. Agree. So we have five, two, five, uh, so the motion passes, five to two. <clears throat> Thank you, Melissa. Under the non-consent agenda, I missed item A as we started uh, through here. Before we get into the uh, policy readings, uh, we have our superintendent evaluation 
that the board uh, participated in evaluating our superintendent uh, a few months ago. Uh, this process uh, was done initially by individual board members and then we collected that data, turned it in uh, through our attorney uh, McMillan's office and his staff then uh, collated that data and gave us a result which the board saw and voted on as a personnel issue uh, about a month or so ago. I was scheduled to bring this to our open meeting tonight, I mean last month, but I was hospitalized and we didn't get that done. So tonight we're bringing it forward. So this is a non-voting item because it's already uh, had our discussion and vote. This is just to announce to the public that our uh, superintendent has been uh, rated overall as distinguished in the uh, using the state uh, superintendent evaluation scale. It has uh, four operating um, levels uh, after evaluating seven different standards. Uh, he could either be developing, proficient, accomplished, or distinguished. Uh, he was distinguished in five of the seven uh, standards and uh, therefore gave him an overall rating of distinguished. So I'd like to congratulate our, our superintendent on achieving that uh, level of uh, worksmanship with us. Thank you. have one of the hardest working superintendents and support administrative staff uh, as well as hardworking school staff uh, I think in, in any area that you want to compare so we appreciate our leadership let's move forward into the uh, policy changes now uh, we have several at our second readings and will require votes I'll ask Dr. Uh, Taylor to present the first uh, several if you want to do those in, in a group. Sure. Um, Dr. Cash, members of the board, I bring to you tonight uh, four policies and I'll just quickly review these. Policy 3210, parental inspection of an objection to instructional materials. It clarifies instructional materials does not include academic tests or assessments, which is in accordance to the definition in the federal law. Clarifies instructional materials on the internet may not be available uh, for review in advance, and it replaces references to Common Core and essential standards with current statewide instructional materials and standards so that if the state changes um, the curriculum that they don't have to go back and change their policy every time. Policy 3410 is the testing and assessment program. Um, it just changes some reference to repealed statute and uh, some wording there. The Student Accountability and Promotion Policy 3420 um, changes some language in there and adds Section E pertaining to summer reading camps. And uh, we talked about uh, the, the Read to Achieve Summer Camp Task Force that Dr. Carricker is heading up will bring some recommendations to us because that camp will no longer be a requirement for students who do not are not proficient and it will also be open and eligible for students who were proficient uh, and the board may um, entertain parents on and students on a fee base for those summer reading camps. And also adopting policy 4050, uh, children of military families as it's written by the school board association. These policies we've discussed for two months now and they will require a vote this evening. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Questions Leave comments no comments. About these policies. Not entertain a motion to approve these. I make a motion that we uh, adopt these policies. Second. Have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Not all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Our next uh, policy is a first reading and does not require a vote tonight. Uh, absences due to inclement weather, uh, Dr. Lassane. Yes, policy 7550 um, came about, the proposed changes to this came about as a result of a committee that we pulled together to provide some clarity for when we have 
inclement weather. This particular policy focuses on absences with some of the questions that we have received regarding to this um, policy. We're still sending it forth for first reading, but we are going to convene a committee to talk about tardies, which is different than the absences. So this is when you miss full days um, regarding inclement weather, but we still will be pulling that committee together to look at delays to make sure that we are consistent across the district. Are there any questions regarding this first reading of policy 7550? Not then, let's move forward to the next uh, few policies. Uh, Dr. Lassane will present, uh, I believe it's item H, I, J, and K. Uh, if you want to present those, these are second readings and will require a vote. Exactly. The four policies that are before you for a vote are policy 7100, and for the purpose of the record, I'll go through um, basically what's involved with these policies. 7100 is the recruitment and selection of personnel, and all of these involve minor edits for that policy. It's updates to the legal references, and it also adds a footnote um, regarding the State Board of Education action as far as adopting a policy on teacher contracts. So it's basically alignment to all of the things coming out of the General Assembly. Policy 7405, it deals with extracurricular and non-instructional duties, and it replaces all references to the Common Core, and it makes that more open to focus on current statewide instructional changes, um, standards. So as it changes, it's not connected to a specific name. It also updates some terminology for that policy. Policy 7510, leave, um, adds a hyperlink to the most current benefits and employment policy manual. I will note that the one that is available on DPI's website is not stated. It's the most recent one that's available for that link, but it is not a 2014-15 manual. That manual has not been updated by DPI. Um, it also um, adds hyperlinks to the legal references and updates footnotes. The <laughs> final um, policy with an edit is 7820, which are personnel files that just include some legal updates um, as a result of actions from the General Assembly this past session. Are there any questions regarding these items that are before you for second reading? Questions or comments about these policies? Not entertain a motion that we approve them uh, as written. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Not all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, Thank motion you. Carries. Thanks, Dr. Lassane. Uh, next, we have items L, M, N, O, and P. Um, policies that are all second readings and require a vote. Dr. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cash, members of the board, Mr. Johnson. Uh, would you scroll down just a little bit? Can you scroll it down? <clears throat> Policy uh, 1500 is governing principles, safe, orderly, and inviting environment. It basically is just a, a change in some wording uh, related to um, foods, the food versus child nutrition. It just changes it from food uh, service to child nutrition. So it's just some very minor word changes. Policy 1700 has a similar word change uh, from food service to child nutrition services. Policy 9020 is facility design and it clarifies the um, at risk uh, way that we bid projects. Uh, CM at risk is what it's referred to, and it clarifies that pre-qualification of bidding for CM at risk. We've been using this anyway. It's not anything new for us, so it's just an adoption of that policy. 
policy 9115. The pre-qualification brings into to line with the bidding and the CM at risk. And policy 9120, bidding of construction work has to do with the advertisement and the way we advertise, which again, we do already. So it just puts it in uh, to uh, clarify it. I'll be glad to answer any questions related to those. Dr. Miller, anybody questioned any of this? Brought anything up? To no, question? sir. Everything's been clear. Everything's, everything's clear. I'll make a motion we accept Dr. Miller's recommendation. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve these policy uh, readings as stated. Um, any further discussion? Not all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Well, that concludes our uh, non consent agenda items. Uh, we're now uh, at the time for public comment. We do not have anyone sign outside the room to speak tonight to the board. I'll ask once more, does anyone wish to speak to the board from the public tonight? If not, we did have a board member who wished to make a comment, uh, Ms. Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to question your conduct at the uh, Cal meeting last Monday night. For years, I, as well as other observers, have sat quietly at your behest during the Cal meeting as members of the audience. This past Cal meeting, after Dr. Miller acknowledged the work of Mr. Frank Rader in organizing a pro-bond effort, Mr. Rader took the floor and made personal comments. I hold no disrespect for a person who is passionate about education. What I do not respect is that Mr. Rader is not even a part of our extensive ISS family and is given any and all courtesies that you yourself have denied our own parents and faculty. I am sure that anyone on the other side of this particular issue would not be afforded the same courtesy. The general statutes and ISS policy are clear on the public's opportunity to address the board I will remind all of you that I personally have faced Dr. Cash's discipline in a like environment, and I will make it known now that if a member of the audience at a future Cal meeting has something to add to the business before us, I will remind you of this sole event and ask it to be the pleasure of the board to hear future comments. I would like to ask that all of us as board members to. Um, to conduct ourselves in a consistent and professional manner as it relates to the business of our schools. I would also like to comment um, <clears throat> on recent remarks to the local newspaper with regards to um, when perhaps a board member questions the superintendent or the um, department heads uh, about actions or inactions. I view that as holding staff accountable for their actions or inactions. I do not consider that bullying. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. I uh, would like to make one uh, comment back uh, because I, I also felt a little bit uncomfortable when uh, Mr. Rader began to speak uh, last uh, meeting. The difference in my mind, and again, we're all board members, uh, I've been elected chairman and try to uh, actually conduct those meetings according to our policies. The thing that was a little bit different last uh, month was Dr. Miller was our administrator at the podium carrying on the conversation addressing the, uh, the board. Dr. Miller asked Mr. Rader for his comments as I, because I caught that and I realized that was a little bit out of our uh, usual uh, operational uh, manner in terms of having people speak to the board or speak among the board as we're having our committee of the whole meeting uh, 